I'm really excited to be talking to um, Vicky and Paul about this. It's, um, and uh, hoping to have a little bit of a trip down memory lane. Um, but first of all, um, I wanted to start with the current show and in search of Kimizoa and um, really to, to get a bit of a more background about um, what the show's about and to, you know a bit more detail about that working. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it all started in 2018, mm. wasn't it? Which feels a long time ago now. Um, but we were contacted by um, Pamela Winfrey, who's a scientific uh, curator, uh, um, the biodesign. So she works with Arizona Cancer and Evolution Center. And um, she signs off her emails with this little kind of uh, crested cacti, um, which we didn't have a clue what this was at the time. Um, it looks like a cowboy cactus with a broccoli grafted onto the top of it. It's really Yeah, bizarre, so it's really it? unusual. And it was like really weird at the same time. Um, so she was contacting us about another project Afterglow um, that she had seen of our work. And um, and she really loved that piece. Um, and she said, would you be interested in working with a scientist there? Um, and of course, like as soon as we found out, like, you know, biodesign, all the scientists there are inspired by nature. We were like, yes, we would love to go. Um, and then we later found out that this cacti has got a mutation, um, which is a bit like cancer. Um, and it was something that we were really interested in because it's something that looks, um, you, you can see the cancer and it looks really, really beautiful as well. Um, so that started the collaboration where we went and did a residency there. Um, we met Dr. Angelo Fortunato, who is working with model organisms. They're all like kind of marine life. Um, and that's when we met, well, well, we met, we did meet the Placozoa, mm. didn't we? Which yeah. I suppose uh, were the were part of the inspiration for the the the, the creatures that we we invent. Well, well, we say we invented them. They were very much kind of invented collaboratively between us and the scientists. Because his, um, I mean, he was a really interesting guy. We kind of call him Doctor Doctor Angelo because um, he he um, he had these two kind of backgrounds: one in medical biology, but the other in ecology as well. So. Uh, that was perfect for this idea of kind of creating these model organisms because um he not only can he understand those from a medical perspective by a medical perspective but in terms of keeping them in the lab keeping these things happy and healthy in the lab he can really understand um what they what they would need to keep them happy and healthy and um and the it was really interesting because then the conversations that we had with him were in part very much about the cancer and the, and, and the new kind of therapeutic treatments and the new approach to cancer that they were um, developing, but also something that was coming quite personal from him about his interest about these creatures and how they were really kind of that they might there was a lot of unknowns about them and he felt that they might be really important um, in terms of their um, the way that they would be effectively managing their ecosystem and these ideas all came together with this kind of virtual organism that is on the one hand struggling with an internal um an internal kind of um cellular mechanic that um we, we can understand as a cancerous um process but on the other hand it through its its attempt to cope with that it then brings balance to its environment it has this life cycle that kind of brings balance to that um, environment and this idea of balance is really kind of important in the work but it's also you know coming back to um the cactus with uh um with cancer the thing that really kind of struck us was that on the one hand you know they're kind of incredibly beautiful but um cactuses don't die from from cancer they live these long healthy lives with cancer. And actually and they're like more exclusive. So like collectors really love these cacti with these mutations because they're really unique as well. Um, but yeah, also saying a bit about the aspects residency as well, because not only were we lucky enough to be in biodesign, um, but we also got the pontoon residency in 
yeah, it was 2018 to 19. Yeah, yeah. yeah it feels a long time ago now because we've had this odd year in between. Um, but yeah, and that was an opportunity to take, because that came after our residency, well, our first residency in Arizona. And that was an opportunity to start building this simulation of the Chemozoa actually as, at aspects where we had the quality time to kind of work on that and also learning new techniques as well because we um photo we used a photogrammetry technique that we actually did in the studio at aspects so we photogrammetrized the the rock that the chemozoa live in perhaps before you hurt long can you explain a bit about what photogrammetize is yeah, I'm just I'm looking sure around that, that the word, room but... <laughs> for the but... rock that we actually photogrammetried. Photogrammetry is the process. Yeah, but can you photogrammetrize a rock? I don't know, <laughs> but we did anyway, regardless. It's, it's, a, it's yeah, exactly. Really... So, um, oh, the, oh yeah, there's the camera. So I'm not sure if that is going to focus. No, it's not. Yeah. Really. Okay. So it focuses but, on your, this. The mirror to your face. This yeah. is yeah. this is the um the home of the chemo of the chemozoa in the film. So it's a real rock. It it really exists. Um, it's and quite we, well handled now. Yeah. It looks really polished. <laughs> and we just took lots of photographs. And um, photogrammetry is a process that um it's it's incredibly uh clever which means we don't have to be um and and it's it's a, a process that literally uses those photographs from different angles to work out the physical shape of an object and then reconstruct the it, that object as a piece of three-dimensional geometry and then those photographs that um, the images of the photographs are then mapped onto that geometry so you actually end up with something that's quite close to a 3D photograph. Yeah, a so way. it's a way of getting a really detailed rock and they use it a lot in um, gaming. So um, so it's a technique that's used in gaming quite frequently. And we were using a game oh. engine to actually, um, we built the, well, we, we brought this into a game engine and then we brought, um, we built the uh, Chemozoa from cell up um, in the game engine as well. So they, they literally yeah. kind of grow. They start life as a single cell and then kind of divide and yeah. Wow. So like really giving life a, a form in a... It's, it was yeah, a I mean, we a get crazy quite idea. Really, attached to them as well, never, don't we? We've never um, done anything quite like that before. The idea of, you know, yeah. we've, 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 we've had a lot of, we've built a lot of works that have been virtual <laughs> creatures in, but the idea of building one that literally started as a single cell and those cells divide to make the whole. That was something that mm. we how, we kind of. How much control do you have over that? Uh, well, I suppose we we spawn them like you would spawn something in a game, like a, a character or whatever. So we can spawn them like effectively over the rock, um, and we choose the positions in where we're going to spawn them as well. But do you mean like how much control do we have over the growth of? The growth all. of them, the, the way that they sort of look and feel, present themselves. I mean, what Vicky was, I think what you were talking about was we didn't have any control on how they wandered around. Yeah, and that became, but, which and, was quite frustrating, actually, because Paul <laughs> built like camera controls um, so that we could actually navigate in that space um, and literally like not like fly through, but set up different camera angles where we wanted to kind of film them. But sometimes they would like kind of wander off and it was just like, oh, you know, you've got the perfect setup. And it's just like, and then they just happen to go around the corner and you have to wait for ages, don't you, for them to come back or something. So it's a bit like um like a documentary maker or something like, you know, like filming wildlife or something. And then they have to sit in a hide for hours to wait until it does something that they want to film kind of thing. But returning to the individual cells and the kind of, I suppose, the control or how much control we have is like we we wrote a set of rules that very, I suppose, quite accurately determine how those cells should grow and, and how they distribute themselves. But they literally have um, a gene. Each cell has a little genome that it passes on. So when the cells divide and become two cells, that genome is copied. But we wrote into that um, the probability that um mutations or errors would 
occur. So literally some of the some of the numbers, some of the values in, in that copied genome are mutated. And some of those values determine how well that cell can can position itself because they have this way of positioning themselves so that the chemosome have a, a form that means that they have they have different cell types and they end up in different places like they they feed on the surface of rocks so they have these cells that um are um, kind of miming chemosome <laughs> they have these kind of feeding cells um that, that that they move around on and um and um and every so often the cells will check their location to make sure they're in the appropriate place but some of them that have lost that um ability to check end up mm. migrating and moving around. So you end up with a kind of a feeding cell um, at the top. So if you if you look very carefully in the, in the, in the installation aspects, you'll notice that there's a, 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 a very thick clump of these cells at the bottom, but there's quite a few that kind of get positioned in other places. And that's effectively um, 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 one of the hallmarks of cancer, you, you could say when cells lose their um, ability to work um, in relation to other cells as they should work mm -hmm. and um, and the chemosome themselves are trying to manage that through a process of poisoning those cells but in a way that doesn't kill the whole the whole uh, organism but tries to tries to get rid of those cells that are um, are starting to behave erratically um, so effectively, we had a key on our keyboard that was we put we put sticky labels on our keyboard mm -hmm. for our controls, and one of those keys were it was a chemo key, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, so it would yeah. administer the. So we like literally was giving it triggering off its chemo dose when it was feeding off toxic algae. Um, yeah, yeah. So were you having to sort of like spot when it was feeding? give it that taste. Or... Yeah, I, I mean, it's it, it was um, very much the whole kind of work is very much a, a combination of things that are quite accurate from a simulation point of view, you know, they're quite accurate descriptions. And then 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 we're kind of like contriving to make things happen when we want them to happen so that we can capture that um in more of a filmic way so it kind of sits i suppose it sits very much two, yeah. in between these two things of you know um i mean so we're doing things uh, that you would never do in a in a in the context of a, a scientific you know in a scientific kind of context but they're things that we kind of they're compromises that we have to make in order to or you know that we was making in order to get the the product that we was aiming for yeah um, um, talking of filmic quality, it's it really sort of stunning and there's this beautiful environment and you've got shots below and above the surface. Can you sort of tell us a bit more about how you were able to produce that? Yeah, so um, I mean, this is quite unusual work for us in the way that there's like a an environment, a, an actual environment that exists as well. Um, so we really wanted the chemozoa to live somewhere where it was rugged um and there was lots of crevices in the holes and th in the holes of the rock and things um so we sought out this location in spain um where potentially the like placozoa the that inspired the chemozoa could actually live there mm. um so it felt like a good location um where we could site um our chemozoa um, and so the the opening sequence is obviously like an establishing shot of this environment that they could potentially live in. Mm. Um, and then obviously, because they live und under water, we had to have, like you say, this transition from like above land to um, uh, going beneath the water. Um, and so it was quite fun filming that um, because it was the first, I think it was the first time I'd ever done any underwater footage. Yeah. Yeah, and I really like scuba dive, well, snorkeling. So that was kind of nice because I could like do a recce of all the kind of locations. Um, and we had to build a rig, didn't we, to actually take, because um, we we're kinda... using a little action camera, um, which is a bit like a GoPro, but it was like yeah. an Osmo. And we built our own rig to keep that camera steady. 
um, when we plunged it kind of underwater. Um, so it was a bit of experimentation there um, because we'd never really done anything like that. Yeah, we kind of learned a huge, and there's so many things on this project that we that are completely new to us. Like the photogrammetry was new, building an, org an organism from the cell up was completely new, integrating that with kind of real filmed environments and also then kind of trying to, because we wanted to, you know, we wanted this being to be quite magical and, you know, in, in a way, in a kind of quite a um, a way that you're aware of the contrivance, you know, that it, it looks that um, we've tried to get the, the render quality from the game engine to look in some ways a bit painterly and, and like a piece of graphic art. But then we wanted to integrate that with real environments. And it's really, it's, it's mm. incredibly hard to get that balance right as soon as you start heading towards realism and you do things wrong it looks awkward and uncomfortable and it's really hard to make them look wrong but still look beautiful and that was what we were really you know really Strong. having to work really hard to try and mm. get this balance between um an underwater environment that's very artificial um and an, an above land and um real um real life kind of captured environment that we're integrating with that. Mm. Um, and then some of the shots as well, they have like particles superimposed over them. So we did like kind of close up shots of particles mm. in a tank that we then um, composited over the footage as well. And that was another new thing. Um, and and the color grading, because we did all the color grading ourselves and we've never done any cut. Well, actually we did practice yeah. a bit of color grading, yeah, yeah. but nothing to that sort of extent kind of thing how you find that you work um generally that you you use every project as an opportunity to learn new new skills new i suppose techniques. one of the For one sure. of the questions that we often get asked is why boredom research and 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 often we need to invent an answer every time someone asks us <laughs> And so there's a whole host of different reasons, but that could be a really good reason. I think that we have always been very, um, you know, there's certain things that we've held on to, and that, and a certain kind of focus and 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 an interest that we've maintained. But we, I feel that we do move quite a lot in yeah. terms of wanting to do something new, new and, and something. challenging as yeah, well. Wanted, wanted we get we get bored quite easily. So if we were doing something the same all the time, I think we would get really bored. Um, and yeah, and we're always up for a new challenge. Mm. But saying that a lot of what we've implemented in, in the Chemozoa work, we're now implementing in our current project as well. So we're doing a similar sort of thing in our current project where we're working with another voiceover artist. Um, and that was a first as yeah, well in Kimazoa. We'd never worked with a with a voiceover artist before. Um, and for the for our current project that we're working on, we're we're working with another mm. voiceover artist. It's quite a different piece, but it's still got that kind of quality about it. Hold that before you tell us too much about it, because mm. I'll ask you more about that at the end. But um in turn um there was another question I was going to ask. Oh, yes. Um, so before we were able to open the show, and obviously it is the, 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 the show that's launched our 40th anniversary season and so on, um, the exhibition was shown, the work was shown at Arizona State University and um, we, you, you did a talk at like midnight, <laughs> um, one o'clock in the morning, it's that. Uh, very hard to stay awake for all the time. <laughs> um, but um, it was very science orientated quite rightly you know that's where the scientists that you worked with were based but I wondered if they had reflected on if they had learned anything through the process of working with you as artists Mm, that's a really good question yeah i think um, it's quite a challenging question it's way, quite so. hard to answer yeah um i mean one of the things that we can really say is that the scientist that we work with, Dr. Angelo Fortunato, who's actually features in the film as well. So he's the, the scientist that's looking into the microscope. Um, he was quite quiet. He's quite introverted. Um, and actually something that we found out shortly afterwards is that he gained confidence through the project and actually 
apparently started to become more vocal in meetings as well. And I think something that we gave to him was like a confidence in his work um, mm -hmm. because he's like really passionate about his work. And, and that was something, you know, and that was the reason why we actually featured him in the film in the end, because he was so immersed in this kind of world that we wanted to bring him into the film. Um, it really comes yeah. through in the documentary yeah. the tour that you did with him. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't, I don't really feel that we kind of, you know, increase. I mean, he's a very competent scientist. I don't think we kind of, he, I don't think he needed artists to kind of <laughs> in, 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 improve his confidence as a scientist. But I think he's also, he's really, there's something that is quite interesting about Angelo, that he was quite an observational scientist, that he, a lot of his insight and intuitions came from direct observation, you know, things that he saw with his eyes rather than, than, measurements and quantifications he his brain and he was really he refers to his microscope as a time time machine that when he kind of looked at these placozoa that that he was looking at a very primitive organism and then immersing himself you know when you're looking through that small lens you can literally everything else has has gone and you're immersed in this world and he was really trying to trying to imagine what these things were doing, you know, what their kind of motivations, their behavior behaviors were. So really immersing himself in these kind of bizarre creatures. And he described it as like traveling back in time and almost, and it, which is almost a bit like performative or mm. method acting in mm. a way. So, I mean, my feeling is that he was a very artistic scientist a, a very you know a, a scientist that was well that, we know that, he was artistic well, because because he yeah. uses this method of putting acetate up on the tank of the placozoa and then plotting them and he does it their, their movements um and he does it all by hand which is really rare now for a scientist but when he showed us these drawings that he makes they're absolutely beautiful mm. they're really stunning um so i think having you know enabled us to have that dialogue with him about aesthetics um, and then also show him when we first showed him the work of the chemozoa he was really captivated mm. wasn't he and he was like going oh this could really exist you know it was lovely it was like this magical moment that we had with him um which was really nice um so i don't know whether i've really answered your question i suppose but... no i think that... he, he was um, <laughs> i think we we helped kind of activate the artistic sort of side of his of his science kind of person of his science persona and I think that mm. kind of uh, that we heard reports back that he'd become a bit more um vocal afterwards yeah. so so maybe that kind of just you know helped yeah the um I love the idea of the microscope as a time machine and now I want to take you back so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so it's so and yeah, as I as I just mentioned, um, this show in search of Kimisova is the um, the first of our fortieth anniversary um, program in twenty twenty one, and um, of course the reason that we felt it was really appropriate following your residency to invite you to show at the gallery this year in particular is because you are in our archive um you are part of our history so um theater of restless automata was shown at the previous site in brown road in um 2005 16 mm. years ago um so and when you were talking about um generating forms life forms um i think perhaps in search of um so theater of restless automata was that was one of the first projects that you did that so can you talk a little bit about that work and and what that was about and i know that um vicky is going to put um a link in the chat um of my memories of that show as part of our um aspects of 40 stories so yeah, I mean, it was quite a big body of work for us at the time in in that way as well, um, because we've been doing a lot of net art stuff, mm. hadn't we? Um, but we were really interested in building systems that were kind of standalone systems. So they were computer driven that weren't interactive. 
um, we kind of felt like they were interactive objects because the beings that we had created, the artificial life beings inside these systems were like kind of interacting with each other and their environment as well. So we did actually see them as interactive objects, even yeah. though they weren't like you couldn't click on them or they didn't have any sensors or anything like that. I suppose that. we should say for anyone yeah. that has got no idea what we're talking about. <laughs> That yeah. what they effectively what they were were um uh, I suppose you could they were like a it was like a virtual fish tank yeah. filled with um these digital beings that were generated and 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 the works existed as these black um circles with a porthole in and you looked through this kind of glass window into this electronic you know this digital world and these kind of bright cre creatures would appear sick, from time to time. That? Yeah, so I, I used to, the gallery floor. Yeah, and mm. I used to call them like kind of vivariums because they felt a bit like, you know, kind of like Paul said, like tanks, but also like you were looking into a window into a world kind of thing. And we created them as quite nice objects because at the time we hadn't sold any artwork, but we were thinking, okay, we could really think about the way that we package our artworks to be something that was potentially more sellable um mm. uh, you know that that could open our work up to you know different um clients potentially still, 16 years ago was still really early days for you know digital art practice it wasn't you, you didn't see it in every gallery by any stretch yeah and it's kind of really interesting to think back and to think how you know how we've kind of moved through different kind of um periods where we've focused on very different things and and i suppose at that time we were probably more conscious of you know maybe what we might call traditional arts practice and digital arts practice being mm -hmm. quite separate mm -hmm. and trying to you know think about um that relationship and and how we should really be operating as you know artists working with you know quite contemporary tools but in a in, in an art world that was quite in in many places quite uh traditional and mm. and kind of focused on the object you know the idea of the object mm. and i think I, and I think that kind of um that sort of preoccupation with the object was more present in those works than it maybe is now mm. yeah i'd agree with that yeah yeah the um it was part of a tour um and I, certainly not something we've done a lot of more recently but it it went to Peterborough Digital Arts and to HTTP in London. It's just sort of reflecting as you spoke, and both of those other organisations in the tour were specialist digital arts mm. organisations. Mm. Don't know if it's my internet being a problem. We can still hear you. We can you, still hear you. you. Right. Still okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, yeah, it always tells me afterwards that my internet connection is unstable. So <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, so as I was saying, that the um, that they were specialist organisations, and I had a few years earlier um, uh, done an MA in computers and application to art history. So it was very interested in digital work, but has made that shift to work in, in a more generalist organization like Aspects, you know, where all mm. art forms are coming. So from, from my perspective, it's very much about trying to bring digital art to a wider, mm. a wider audience. But um, I think it's, um, it's also really important that that need at that time to make the work physical rather than entirely ephemeral. Mm. Um, I know, Vicky, you were saying that as a consequence, you actually had gallery representation after that mm. exhibition. Yeah, because um, Wolf Liza, who runs the Digital Art Museum in Berlin, saw those pieces, or he actually saw the biomes and I think ornamental bug gardens as well. Because yeah. they went on after the tour in the UK, they went on and they went to the um, LA, I think, 
Yeah, or... so they went to a big festival called SIGGRAPH, which um, is all kind of around computer generated works. And they have like an art gallery component of that as well as emerging technology component. And so we showed those artworks there um, and that's where he saw them and um, and got really excited about them because obviously he was representing artists at the time that were doing um, everything was kind of computer driven um, so a lot of the early kind of algorithms kind of um, work um, and he was really excited mm. that we'd kind of package these pieces into these framed objects that you could literally just walk off and hang up on someone's wall um, and yeah, and he contacted us. It was a little while after because it took us a while to tour the work to, you know, internationally. Mm. But I think it was he started representing us in 2007. So a kind of couple of years after the show. Um, and that was a long term representation as well. So we took the works to his gallery. Um, and so, yeah, he sold some of the pieces that we showed at Aspects and, and they're now hanging up in people's homes, which is really lovely. Yeah. Um, How is the longevity of them? Do you have to sort of maintain them? I think, I mean, certainly that is, I mean, we there was we have there was one um yeah, one system biomes, that we yeah. we kind of had to refresh the system um but i think it's a really uh, it's another area that is just really interesting and oh. i think i mean i think there's a massive um there's a massive separation or um can't, uh, the, a massive gap between the amount of cultural product that is really kind of dependent on tech on technology that's kind of computer driven and the amount that's actually well documented and archived and captured in in those collections that are responsible okay. for kind of you know really keeping a track and documenting human cre create creativity and that's i mean that's quite um a concern really yeah. and it is something and it's something that we've very much through a lot of our practice we've been very um conscientious of we've been we've tried really hard to um try and create um um the artifacts and then archive them in a way where they can enter into collections and be preserved it is something that um you know that no one can say they have a solution to because the technology is in inherently kind of temporary yeah. um, um but we've all you know we've tried to do everything we possibly can to 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 think about you know how how a, at least a, some kind of record can be be kept of of the of these works i mean for example the last yeah the last work that we that was um purchased was by southampton city art gallery yeah and um and we actually gave them the live version of, 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 of um, the work, but also a video documentation that's, I think it was kind of two hour mm. long capture of the work. So, so, so the, it kind of still feels like you're watching the work because it's so long that it's a really nice kind of document of the work. And we're starting to do that more and more with different projects. Um, so we have like a, a live version and then a video version as well. And we kind of joke that it was our first feature film. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So the, um, I think I want to go on to talking about how you exist as artists because obviously you know artists need to like earn money make a living um you know and that's a, a a real concern for us and for you particularly in 2005 you were um within the first sort of 10 well just under 10 years of your of your mm -hmm. practice um so um you know and, and I'm interested in sort of how since 2005 to today, you know, that how you've how you've been able to create a sort of a, a practice to sustain to sustain yourselves as artists. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's gone through lots of different phases. 
um, as probably most artists um, find. Um, I mean, definitely in 2005, we were applying for quite a lot of Arts Council funding. So obviously the touring show was um, funded by the Arts Council, which was really great. Um, and we actually, I think we got a travel grant from the British Council, didn't we, to kind of tour some of the work to other festivals afterwards, which was brilliant as well. Um, so we've had a long period of our practice in academia as well, so also teaching, um, which we've um, resurfaced from recently. It's um, kind of interesting. Because yeah, we, <laughs> we, um, because I think we sort of, we got more deeply involved in academia after that first show. Uh, um, aspects yeah. aspects the kind of torah exhibition and then with this show we've kind of come yeah back there must be something and they're like them. about working with aspects <laughs> like, the to be like art is full time um i think it probably coincided yeah. with being parents as yeah. well because i yeah. think you know that when you have um a, a, you know when you have a kind of more of a family responsibility, then a regular income becomes a little bit more mm. um, something that you um, feel is important. And it's probably the fact that our, our 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 son is now kind of like you know he's uh, warning to everyone he's actually on the road now. He's, kind of, <laughs> he's driving a car. It's no longer safe um, to, to be on the road. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm sure he drives a very good driver. Yeah, very good. Remember, driver. this is going to go yeah, on yeah, YouTube. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and so we kind of feel a little bit more kind of relaxed and, yeah, and, and, sure. and kind of, you know, comfortable, yeah. um, you know, taking that risk to operate completely as an artist, because it is a challenging environment to operate in. Mm. And, um, you but know. we have also been with because we've been working on these um, like long term arts and science projects as well. We've been able to tap into a bit of science funding as well, um, which is which is really helpful. Um, so and there is a lot of it's kind of emerging at the moment. It feels like there seems to be a big movement of um, sci art projects coming out. Um, so there is different funding streams that we're able to tap into, which has been great. Um, and a lot of the recent projects, a lot of them have been have come from residency. So like our early practice, perhaps we were in residence quite early on when we actually produced Torah. Did we did a residence. Banff, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. For them. Yeah, so just before then we went to Banff, um, mm. and which was phenomenal. Um, and it's one of those things that you never forget when you meet another Banff person, <laughs> or someone that's been to Banff. It's like, oh, you never forget going. So for those who don't know, can you can you explain what Banff so is? So Banff is a art centre in Canada that um, they do a lot of international residency programs, and and um, and at that time they were certainly they were doing a lot of thematic programs where they would have a theme and they would invite a whole group of artists in from different places around the world, and they would kind of you know interact and produce work all in relation to to this theme. So it was and it. it and it has a fantastic restaurant. So like, and you, you, you don't, it's like a dream, to, really, you don't isn't have it? to worry about anything <laughs> apart from kind of Make working care. on your, on your practice. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, and it's, um, it's phenomenal for meeting other practitioners as well. So there was people from all different disciplines. So we actually worked with some musicians when we were there as well, which was fantastic. Um, but the theme when we were there was time. Mm. Um, so um, in that period, and we still are interested in time now, especially like creating systems that run over long periods of time. Um, uh, and that's when we created our first system where we were kind of looking at emergence and things like that. And um, mm. and some of that behavior stuff is that was actually in, implemented in the works in theater of Restless Automata. So it's kind of like that kind of transition to making those kind of object works as well. Mm. Yeah. But I think, you know, from the from, in, you know, thinking about the kind of question of, of how you survive as artists, I think, you know, mm. in a, throughout our career, we have been in lots of very different, we've worked in lots of very different kind of contexts. We've worked in a public art context, you know, we've worked with a gallerist, we've worked on a, in commission kind of a base in a festival kind of, you know, in a media kind of festival a context and academic context. And, and what you realise is that, you know, 
everything is a compromise. You know, the, 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 I think sometimes when you're quite, um, you know, young and emerging into a field that you feel that there's this kind of perfect situation that you could be working in. And, and I think it, that you realize that it's finding the right compromise. It's finding the compromise that works for you. Uh, maybe at that given time at, at that mm. time. Yeah. Um, that allows you to do the, you know, the, the thing that you feel is really important without that being kind of too heavily compromised. Mm. Yeah, no, fantastic. So, um, you've talked about, uh, your, your increase in you know, the number of residences that you're doing at the moment, there's those opportunities out there for you and, and you've been successful at, at securing some, can you sort of talk about what you're working on now? Yeah, yeah, it's quite a big project. <laughs> <laughs> so we were commissioned, it all started during COVID actually. Um, well, actually we applied for it pre-COVID, mm. um, but we were awarded this commission um, from the Human Cell, it's, it's, it's called the Human Cell Atlas Project, um, and it's funded by the Wellcome Trust, um, but they're commissioning um, four different artists, so it's quite a big program um, from different cities as well to work with um, the researchers that are working on this human cell atlas project which they're hoping to map like well it's going to be an ongoing it's a lifetime work for them but they're hoping to map every single cell in the human body so that's like probably like 37 trillion cells which that's is thing, like no, phenomenal no one really knows yeah. how many cells there are in the human body so there's a lot the numbers vary quite considerably yeah. but but that's um, sort of the range um and so we're working with some scientists at oxford university who are looking at um autoimmune diseases um, which is really interesting. Um, and in particular, we've been working with a scientist called Martin Perkowski, who is his personal interest is interested in microbial extinction, which is really, really interesting. Yeah. And it's it? been, I mean, it sort of fits us perfectly because we've been really, we've become increasingly interested in just ideas of health. Um, you know, very much, I suppose, on the one hand, health from a biomedical perspective when we think about us you know we, we we're quite good at being preoccupied about our own health but then also from an ecological uh, perspective that there's these kind of ideas of health that exist outside the body um as well and um this kind of uh, and and his kind of work really kind of brings those together in the way that um you know, an idea of extinction which it, or you know or biodiversity loss which is something that we're very kind of you know conscious and aware of as an external thing and that there's you know humans are quite good at sort of separating themselves from let's say you know an idea that there's the natural world and there's humans and that we're quite um separate but the fact that there's a parallel kind of process going on inside of ourselves where um you know the the diversity of bacteria in our guts on which we depend to stay alive and fit and healthy is also suffering um, in, uh, from a similar kind of diversity loss. And it's increasingly um, becoming apparent that a lot of health problems relate to this kind of process that mm -hmm. it's, it's really kind of just a process, it's confusing our immune systems that that, that internal environment is changing so massively that our immune systems are no longer able to um, read their environment and make sense of their environment so they behave erratically. Yeah, and that's so what we experience in auto in, immune, in, immune disease. disease. Yeah, so we're, we're kind of making this film at the moment, which which starts off in, in a forest. So we're lucky because we live near the new forest. So we were able during lockdown to kind of film in the forest where we live. Um, and then it takes you so it, it's basically about an old uh, man who is ill um, and he's reflecting on things as he takes a journey through the forest um, and um, and he's realizing the complexity of that forest um, and all the micro life that is living in that forest and it makes him reflect on his body um, so eventually there's this transition 
um, from the forest, but in into inside the body. Um, so we filmed um, the whole forest in winter. So the trees kind of look like skeletons. They're almost like reminiscent of kind of, so you see human shapes in them. Um, and then eventually you kind of get transported into this world where you're actually effectively, you're in, in the gut. Aren't you? But hopefully, so kind of, I mean, hopefully quite seamlessly. So it's not yeah. like a kind of like a, a guy a flying into the body type thing. It's you become immersed in this biological environment, which then just hopefully will just feel strange and different. And 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 that's because we've made a, a, a transition from the real filmed environment to mm -hmm. a, a, a computer generated internal space that has a similar quality and also there's this idea of a brewing storm so it being in the forest and this idea of a storm approaching but then when that kind of effectively when that storm breaks it's a cytokine storm a storm of cellular behavior rather than a storm of kind of wind and mm. and rain yeah so it's using a lot of the techniques that we learn in the Kemozoa, because again, we've got this like kind of filmed environment, um, but then it takes you into the CG. So a lot of the stuff that we learned from building in search of Kemozoa is sort of implemented, obviously in a different way, but, but the sort of techniques are quite similar. But knowing you, you're also pushing yourself to learn new stuff. So what, yeah. what, <laughs> what is quite what are you doing now? <laughs> well, it seems <laughs> like... The Kemozoa project, we built it in a game engine, so it was like real time rent, um, yeah, real time rendering. Whereas this is, yeah, we're using um, a more of a, yeah, I suppose you could say, rendering. a more of an orthodox animation process, oh. but um, so um, but it still has that simulated kind of behavior. So, we've we, we've built a um, a model of cellular interaction that is. Uh, you know, an incredibly simplified version of an immune system um, um, that allows us to um, then recreate a, a kind of a cellular behavior that has this complexity and, and quality that should be, uh, you know, should relate very closely to the way an immune system would behave when it becomes disrupted and it creates this feedback cycle mm -hmm. so that it's kind of it's um um it's literally um responding to its own confusion um and that's a, and that's written as a kind of a simulation in in very much very similar in a very similar way to the way that some scientists work in terms of simulating cellular behavior but then we're we're implementing that in a three in a 3d animation system where we're having to generate Either, either kind of generate textures that we're then mm. mapping onto the three D um, geometry, or literally generating cells that then kind of yeah. uh, um, react and. And then when you see the storm, there's like thousands of cells. So obviously we've had to render out. This has been epic rendering for us. So it is like kind of off the scale to what we've done before um, in regards to how much re like we're having to leave machines 24 seven, like kind of rendering out. So our office gets quite hot. <laughs> <laughs> it's lucky we only had a, a, a week uh, heat wave then, isn't it? Um, have you got a particular deadline for this project? Have you got a particular sort of like output? Is the film being shown? Yeah, so the yeah. film is going to be shown as part of an online exhibition and that's going to launch in November. Um, so they decided to go, obviously, with COVID and the restrictions, they decided to take it online with this one. Um, but yeah, we're hoping to finish it before um, because we're going to be in residence in Ireland in mid August to September. So um, so we've got another project that's coming up on on board, which um, we're really excited about as well, because it involves us going to a beautiful part of Ireland, the Cavern Burren, and I'm working with geologists as well. So we're going to be doing a lot of on site work um, and it's all around the Shannon River. Um, so we're probably going to get wet at some point yeah. as well. <laughs> well and, 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 the, and the source of the river, which is very much starts underground. So there's and there's this, so there's a kind of a, a network of these these underground um, pathways and caves, some of which have been plotted and they kind of know the path that the river takes, some of which are unknown. But there's and so there's this kind of mysterious underground space, which is always kind of fertile, fertile ground for the um, 
imagination and we're going to be working interestingly with this project we're, we're going to be working both with i suppose the the, the uh scientists but also um folklorists or people that are in, mm. you know into kind of um folklore history and trying to bring those two yeah, worlds we're, together we're thinking about creating a mythical being that feels like it lives underground um so we want to use some of the stories from the local communities um to kind of like imagine what this being could be kind of thing yeah um before that's brilliant it's like you're so busy <laughs> <laughs> um so before we um, take a look at the questions that um, the people have asked, um, I know that you said that um, the, the online version of the work is launching today with Video Club. Is there anything sort of more you want to say about that? I know that um, Vicky has already put a um, link in the chat, but I think some people have joined us um, after that link was put in. So maybe um, Vicky could repaste it. Um, so yeah. yeah, we could, we could talk and, a bit about that. Yeah. You know, I'd be interested to know, like obviously you've, you've, you've just done two gallery presentations of this work. Mm. You know, how has this online, um, yeah, this online presentation differed. Mm. Yeah. So I suppose like the gallery version is like a three channel moving image piece. Obviously you've got three screens in, in the aspects gallery. Um, so for the online version, we had to really think about how we make that as a single screening uh, version. Um, so we brought um, I mean, but the central screen in the moving image piece is that is predominantly the one that has the dialogue. Um, the voiceover. Yeah, I mean, I suppose um, we kind of conceived the work. We we was always conscious that we wanted the work to exist in these two firms. We wanted to make something that would that would be quite an immersive experience in a gallery context, um, um, but also has um, a. Is it, the, there's these two things that were, were really important to us. We wanted to really explore this idea of. A, a kind of a documentary um, aesthetic in the way that information was kind of presented, but the information that's being presented is much more um, poetic and also has a as a kind of a timing and a pace that's quite meditative. Mm -hmm. So and and really, you know, I think the gallery context is the best place for that to happen. Mm. But then in that it has this narrative arc as well that that in in many ways has a start, a middle and an end. Um, and so we had this kind of problem of trying to create something that would be able to sit between these two very different ways of thinking one that's a, a very much an, an immersive experience that you kind of enter and exit at any at any kind of chosen point, as you would in a gallery, but it's like there, there also work as a single screening where you kind of start at the start and end at, at the end. So the work was all, all, always conceived to have this kind of cyclical quality that it kind of starts where it ends and it, you know, it kind of it completes the circle so that you can watch it in, in an endless loop. And then for the single screen, we kind of break that and we kind of reassert that more mm. Mm. linear kind of dimension of the work and then try and fold in some of the the more kind of immersive shots from the side screens yeah in in a way that kind of works in that single kind of single screening thrust yeah. yeah so that's so that's on the exhibition and then what's really lovely as well is that we've brought together lots of other things so that obviously you've got the documentary on there as well um, but also some educational resource things that Aspects has done, um, but also the scientists at Arizona, because there was some um, um, science students that were really taken with the work um, and they wanted to build a, a model around the Kemozoa. So they've actually created an interactive um, tool. Um, which you can download um, and it's got graphic representations of the chemozoa and you can um, change the parameters. You can choose how much food you give them and things like that, which is really sweet because it was like, 
it was like the science students being inspired by our work. Yeah. Um, science inspired by art, inspired, inspired by science. <laughs> <laughs> Everything's very circular. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. So that is live now as of today. Yeah. Yeah. So fantastic. Feels very timely. Um, so it's now eight o'clock and um, unless there's anything desperate you want to desperately you want to say, shall we take a look at the questions? Yeah, yeah that would be great. Yeah. OK, so I've, I've got four questions here at the moment. Um, so um, lots from Helen. So that's fantastic. Thanks, Helen. Um, so Helen asks, you mentioned that you strive to combine reality um, with a desire to make something beautiful. Do you ever find reality beautiful and or do you ever have the desire to make something grotesque? Oh, that's yeah. such a good question. Yeah. Liking well, the question. Yeah. What? Liking the question. You're liking the yeah. question. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah, that can, it opens up some things that we don't talk about very often, mm. actually, which is really interesting. Um, because there is, so we, we take the first part of that. Obviously, we are always inspired. I mean, we're, from day one, Borden Research has been inspired by natural systems. So we do a lot of like walking and things like that. And we, they are always looking for the beauty <laughs> in in things mm. um so it's a really important part of our work and i would say like and we try to get poetics in there as well even but very more. much beauty yeah. you know thinking not not only you know not a, not a, in terms of nature as an image you know but nature as a process nature as a, as you know that the image is kind of is maybe the thing that we see first but then behind that image there's a whole set of things going on that are the reason why we ex have that um experience so and i think it's that kind of that beauty that we're really you know that we tend to be quite comfortable abstracting things and just thinking about how things might um, mm. um behave or work or um and that and that really is what led us to collaborate with scientists because it's a very similar way of thinking or engaging with the world but the thing is that there is i mean i feel that there's always a kind of a darkness to the work that we create as well a kind of a quite a melancholy mm. tone often it comes through with the sound so when we kind of work on the sound we always often we we try and create quite a somber kind of um tone to the sound well, um, whether we, I don't know, I'm not I sure mean, whether we try and create it or whether it just, it just emerges. Sort of happens. It's just yeah. that by yeah. that time, I mean, because I think that in some ways they have a kind of a growth, a bit like children, you know, they start off cute, but it kind of, you know, and you feel like you've got some control over them and then they make up their own mind and you just have to go with <laughs> that. And I think art, yeah. you know, artworks are very similar things. You start with a kind of a, mm. a vision and an idea that's all kind of worked out in your head. And then you cross this line and it it tells you, you know, you you, you are a slave to it. And it, it and it doesn't matter what you think anymore. You just have to do what is right for that work. And it's normally in that latter part mm. that thing, I think that melancholy tone comes in. Yeah, and also in our and I'm titles not sure as well. Whether it's a yeah. choice or whether it's the only way that we can take the Yeah, work. or it's an unconscious act. But I mean very much in our titles, if you go back to really early titles, there's kind of loss in the titles and and things like restless and and this kind of like um almost like this friction. Um, and and very much now we're dealing with um, where we were in the early days, we were dealing with di uh, biodiversity and like um, that kind of breadth that you kind of get in nature. We're now looking at it more and more from a fragility mm. kind of aspect and kind of thinking about the loss of some of these ecosystems and, and the loss of some of these species as well. Um, that you know, it's in inevitable that it will be there will be some sort of darkness there, or or kind of some sort of melancholy. Um, but yeah, I mean, cancer is a difficult subject to kind of delve into anyway. Um, and it was quite interesting when we showed it to the scientists that Kimazoa work because one of the psychologists said, um, "We haven't used in in the narrative. You haven't used the word cancer." 
Um, and actually it was the first time that we really thought about yeah. that. We hadn't really thought about that we hadn't used the word cancer. Um, and whether it was because we were being sensitive to the subject, um, I'm not sure why we didn't actually incorporate it. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I felt when we was asked that, you know, it's suddenly kind of forced to think about it. And I felt that, um, that, um, that we, we, we didn't want to, I mean, I think um, cancer is a word with a certain drama. Mm. And, and I think we, we really didn't want to trade off of that. You know, we wanted to create something that was very much, you know, deeply embedded into um, the science that we had experienced and, so, and the kind of processes that we had experienced and that was explicit in, you know, it's, it, it's a hugely explicit in terms of the kind of mechanisms it, it, it's kind of talking about, but wanting to do that in a way that was quite gentle mm -hmm. and not, not creating, the, an, you know, um, um, an, and I think, aggressive interaction with the subject. Yeah, but I think that comes through in other works as well, because obviously we've done the piece on malaria as well. And some people like when they watch that piece afterglow, they kind of they've, they've spoken to us afterwards and they said, I had no idea it was about malaria. Um, and and also like how I could watch an infection scenario and it actually be something really, really beautiful um which was like really interesting to kind of like have that response from something where you're actually looking at the movement and behavior and perhaps you get like really transfixed in that and you kind of forget that you're looking at something that actually is quite dark you know it's like you know people die from these diseases um and it is mm. quite a dark subject matter um, but i think that's our way in isn't it a lot of the time but yeah it's i mean the mechanics behind malaria or, or disease transmission are really kind of the mechanics just behind kind of um, a living system that grows and expands which is exactly what humans do so you know it's 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 sometimes if you kind of focus on that human perspective you know you can interpret things in a very particular way and I think maybe what we try and do is abstract that a little mm. bit and just think about you know here's a system and this system has its own beauty regardless of whether it's something that causes suffering mm -hmm. in, in, in humans. Mm. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? Because of course you started this work, as you said, in, in um, 2018 and in 2020, there was you know, a massive pandemic, which uh, postponed the show, um, but um, also has, you know, um, COVID itself has so many resonances with this work. Uh, you know, have, have you reflected on that at all or had time to sort of, process mm. in relation to you know showing the work at this time but yeah that perhaps it's viewed differently than it might have been in 2020 had there not been yeah yeah I think it went from sort of a work that was for warning to a work that's more current in a sense because I think it was uh, that it I mean the work is part of a body of work that was included in in Arizona in a show called Restless Balance, which is about the idea of trying to have a sense of being at rest and being comfortable, but in a very dynamic situation where we feel a great amount of 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 almost like being pushed out of balance, or you know, a sense of trying to reclaim uh, reclaim a more balanced um, situation, and and and. And I think a lot of the works are, are have probably gone from being more works that were forewarning mm. to more works that are just very much are more. Um, you know, I mean, there's there's always people that are in, in on a different kind of point in terms of how much they're engaging with these subjects because they're quite scary things to really kind of focus on, um, and and I think that that has just shifted significantly with, um, you know, everyone's been really kind of forced to think about kind of COVID, which is mm. very much, you know, a zoonotic, it's very much something that has been been driven by the way humans have kind of set up um, um, the, the perfect situation for, um, for that to happen. Mm. 
It means also that we don't have to explain like in Afterglow where we always had to explain different, uh, the model stages, yeah. like from susceptible to exposed to infectious. We never have to do that anymore because everyone knows like yeah. what R is yeah. and things yeah. like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so in a way i suppose it becomes more relatable uh, yeah. which is yeah. interesting yeah okay um just before we move on to the next question um uh helen asked did you do you have any do you have the desire to make something grotesque you, you've talked about mm. um you've talked about the sort of like the darkness within your works but anything grotesque or we we haven't yeah. made anything grotesque well, yet, but it, we've we had... wouldn't call it grotesque maybe someone else <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but we've definitely had ideas you know one of the ideas i'm thinking of is working with roadkill um but yeah and we've had ideas where we've kind of things that we've made sketches that perhaps we haven't put in the public arena because obviously there's always things you make and then you're not quite sure about it but we made this sketch that had um insect legs in it which were coming out of the ground and it looks kind of a bit if you don't like insect legs. yeah if you're, a, if you're a big fan of insect legs maybe that wouldn't yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah. um, but there's always time yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly as well so um next question is why is permanent work more desirable than ephemeral work uh, yeah uh, um <laughs> is it i don't know mm. whether i mean um Yeah, I, I suppose maybe that kind of relates back to the kind of conversations we had about collections and, you know, the, I mean, I suppose that that's something from pretty from an artist career perspective that every artist kind of likes the idea of of being, you know, um, um, remembered in some some way. It's kind of, you know, it's an ego thing, isn't it, really? That's all it is. It's trying to kind of and I suppose it's what I suppose every artist feels like they want to make a valid, a, a valuable contribution, just, you know, mm to the mm -hmm. world mm -hmm. and one of the ways that that is some is is kind of recognized is when something is stored or preserved in a way because it's seen as being important so i think that's very much something that a lot of artists aspire to um you know but i mean probably most of the most beautiful things are very ephemeral aren't they yeah, you know, in the moment and, and, and yeah. for that moment the fact that they're mm. kind of they're transient and they're lost mm. really kind of yeah. makes them kind of magical so it's I one, think of, one, one of those beautiful contradictions isn't one it? one of the interesting things about our generative pieces is that a lot of the time things are happening in them that you might not see again mm. so oh, they are point. like kind of very process driven anyway um to the point with some of our previous work we used to collect some of the virtual beings because there were sort of virtual beings where we went oh my god that is so beautiful or really striking or really unusual we're just going to mm. capture that in some way um, yeah. and the only way we could capture that is through its data because i'm thinking of whirly gigs um, and also through taking screen grabs as well so we just took screen grabs or video capture of those beings because we knew that you know within a couple of hours they were going to fly off off and then we'd never see them again um which yeah. is kind of interesting and so like the experiences of the people that are, i mean we have actually sold that work and so i think people really like that in the way that they might see something different mm. um something new every day kind of thing yeah, it's kind of a, a really interesting contradiction isn't it that what we that work we we got that work into a, a collection and was really kind of pleased but the whole work itself creates an experience that is transient and a, a ephem ephemeral yeah so even yeah. though it, like the objects are permanent the kind of software is constantly shifting and changing mm. so in a way it kind of crosses both it bridges both things really I know that I promised not to mention your earlier performative day. <laughs> um, right, that's <laughs> the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it has in mind that that feeling of performance, you know, being the, the ephemeral. And I think it's interesting how your very early practice sort of started in that kind of way with video and so on. And, mm. um, you know, that 
um, you know, many of the things that you've discussed around documenting and archiving your work are also the case for performance practice and the, you know, how to, <laughs> okay, I'll move on. <laughs> no, <it's fine. laughs> this is pre-border research as well. So we're, we go very quiet. <laughs> yeah. That didn't exist. That didn't exist. Okay, um, let's move on to the next question. So, um, how do you consider the scientists you work with? Do you go down your own trajectory or ever feel that you need to include their work in your piece? Um, and then Helen says, I will see the installation next weekend. So it may be apparent in the piece. But perhaps oh, yeah. give us some clues. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, some, we work with, lot, obviously we've worked with lots of different scientists. So, you know, so we've worked with biologists, geologists, uh, you know, a lot of scientists recently, biomedical scientists um, and A-life researchers as well, which has been really cool. Um, so, yeah, we work with them and they're all different, you know, so so obviously we kind of um, touch upon different things with different scientists. And I suppose some, depending on what the work is, there's different elements of the scientists in there because like very much like we try and not be prescriptive when we go into a collaboration. So we try and we might have a few ideas and things like that, but we try and not be too prescriptive with the idea before we go in to collaborate with the scientists, because we kind of want that idea to emerge from that kind of dialogue. And, and we do a lot of shadowing of the scientists as well and emerge from that experience. Mm. So I'd very much say that a lot of the pieces, sometimes the emotion or the passion of the scientists does actually get embedded into the piece in some way or form. Um, yeah, I'm thinking of dreams of mice, which is very, very, it's more apparent, maybe. Oh, well, in terms of that was data that came directly yeah, from the scientist that was embedded in the work. Yeah, yeah so sometimes we do actually work with the data and then we embed it into the work. So we did a piece, Dreams of Mice, which took neurons from neron firings of a, 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 a mouse's brain. Um, so whilst asleep. So whilst asleep, yeah. So we were taking that data directly um and and producing the animations from that data um and the same with the afterglow project which was like more about um paddy's models yeah, but I mean, they were like kind of more like um but it wasn't i mean his models were so that we could understand how a scientist model something and then we we created our own model that was very much from thinking about how a scientist would do something and then thinking about how it, that would work as a more of an artistic expression, but mm. he was really feeding into that. So it was more of a collab. I, I think it's something that we've been trying to work out ourselves. And I think, you know, one of the things that, that we, we, we're conscious of that we want the works to be genuine collaborations. Um, and we want the work to that the work that we create to have only been possible from that interaction with the with, with the scientists it's not something the scientists could do on their own it's not mm. something the artists could do on their own it really kind of it comes from that yeah. um that meeting of the two and um you know there's a number of i suppose there's a number of different ways we could um describe that and one of the things i think is um that it's quite apparent that that scientists work in a very particular framework they have a, their own kind of culture and their kind of business framework and um that they um they kind of engage with the subject and then they publish oh. their mm. findings and and the the way that and the kind of the rigidness of that kind of that format that they express themselves in um is quite limiting and i think that by interacting with an artist it, not only it, it not only does that allow the scientists to express things kind of differently because they're thinking about, you know, a very um, different way of working, but it also allows them to think differently about the scientists, about, mm. the, 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 you know, about the subject as well. So the, yeah. there's a real kind of kind of feedback thing that goes on um, there. And I feel like it's that um, it's that emotional kind of connection that we probably you know, something that we maybe wasn't aware of early on, but as we've collaborated more, you know, we're interested in, in the science, we're interested in, you know, what, what, 
what they found out, the kind of techniques, the motivations and the problems. But we're also really interested in crossing that line and finding out about them as an individual and their feelings about a subject, their kind of their, you know, their intuitions or speculations or concerns or the things that maybe kind of keep them awake at, at night. And, and these aren't always things that can be very well articulated in a scientific publication, but yet they they can manifest in an artistic expression. Mm, that's why the collaborations like. have been so long, actually, because we realise it takes a while for the scientists to kind of trust us yeah. um, enough to start, to like, yeah, kind of opening up and kind of like really having quite deep discussions, kind of thing. Um, and I think that's when it starts to get quite exciting. Do you find as you as you sort of move forward and you work with more and more scientists over time? that you are developing a different sort of levels of skills or techniques or um, like getting better at doing it really. Yeah, I mean, we found that in our, our I mean, bio design, we were really lucky um, because um, the two, because we worked across two labs, um, but they work very fluidly anyway. Mm -hmm. So it was like we worked with a psychology lab, but also we worked with like a computational evolution lab as well. Um, but they were working because so like Angelo was working in both labs. So um, it was quite seamless. Um, and but we learned a lot through that process because they, they really opened up. They, they allowed us to go into their kind of lab meetings and mm. almost become part of a team. Like we were part of mm -hmm. the team where they were asking our opinion on you know, some of the science as yeah. well, which was phenomenal. And I think that was the first time that, that you know, like we'd work with people that were so open yeah. in, that, in that kind of framework. I um, and now it's kind of like we're trying to kind of replicate that in other projects. It has been a little bit challenging over the last year where we haven't been able to meet physically with some of the, the scientists. So everything has kind of gone online. We've been going to online lab meetings. We wasn't quite sure how that would go down, yeah. um, but it has been OK, hasn't it? Yeah. It was like um, and like you say, I think we've learned a lot of methods that we've now then implemented in that structure online as well, which has been really helpful. Um, I think there's a real problem with science communication, you know, that, that, that there's, that, that scientists are really, they're charged with this kind of, you know, um, this idea that, okay, um, you've got to make the normal people understand your science now, you know, that, that, and that there's this, and that just leads to so much weirdness in terms of, you know, what, in terms of what the ex expectations are from the scientists and and how they and how they feel that this information should be kind of um delivered to the you know the normal people and i and um and and i think um um it creates it's, we've spoken a lot about in terms of a power relationship that you have the expert that's quite privileged in terms of their insight or their un their understanding or their exposure to you know a, a way of thinking or a, big, you know, a particular understanding um but we don't want that power relationship to follow through in the art you know the art is about a neutral kind of mm. um, exchange that is evenly kind of weighted and and for that to happen, we have to kind of completely put aside this idea of science communication. We're not there as science communi communicators. We're not mm. artists in the service of, 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 of science. We're artists that have our own kind of our own motivations, our own ways of work and our own ways of thinking about a subject. And we come together with the scientists and kind of explore that, you know, and it's often very much in their on their patch, you know, that we're yeah, in oh, their yeah, lab. Right. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. And I think as Vicky was saying, at Biodesign, they kind of already got that, they understood that. And when we, and when we went in, you know, they very much kind of welcomed us in. And I think that in uh, there's a lot of situations where, I mean, we've been quite fortunate in, in that we've always worked with people that have have kind of got things quite quickly in terms of how, you know, how this can really work and benefit everyone. Um, but there's you know we're aware that there's there's lots of scientists that struggle with that and um and um you know it's something that you really have to overcome yeah in order for you mm. know in order to have you know um it, like i say this kind of genuine collaboration that gives rise to this kind of artifact that that 
that that is very much about that interaction between mm. artist and scientist. But we make that quite apparent from the on start. We we make our intention quite apparent with the scientists so that they're clear on that. Um, that how we're going to yeah. work on this yeah. and everything and and if they're not happy with that then we've never experienced it yet but we would probably like go oh bye you know like maybe right. you can find a illustrator or someone that can make a poster for you or whatever yeah yeah I mean so you, I think that's one of the things we've had to become quite attuned to in terms of that you know mm. developing a skill is you have to sense when you know when that genuine engagement isn't there as soon as you possibly can because there's, you know, if if it's not there, there's no point really in kind of, you know, it, it, taking things forward. And we have had, a, you know, a few sort of situations where we've gone, no, we kind of, I think, you know, I mean, I'm not saying, because science communication is still, you know, an important thing, um, but that's very different from what we do. And I think if that confusion is there, it's something that we have to kind of, you know, resolve quite uh, quickly. Yeah, yeah. Um we're, we're running out of time. We have one last question, and it's for me, but it's about you. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, for Joe, how does it feel to work with artists at multiple stages in their career, as you have with modern research, to see them grow and develop their practice? Um, well, it's, you know, it really has been um, an absolute joy um, to have this opportunity to, well, really over these last three years work really closely with you again so with a big gap but obviously we've been in touch throughout um and um i think it's important to say that you know as a as an institution as, an, as a gallery although we've focused historically on supporting emerging artists um we have continuously worked with artists at different stages in their career and sort of thinking about um, David Blandy being in the first um, mm. emergency back in about 2003 and, and, and then eventually becoming a trustee until very recently or Howard Offay being in various projects, taking him to Venice and so on. Um, so it's, it's just, it's always a joy to pick back up with artists when, you know, and, and to, be in each other's lives again um, and certainly from my perspective it's it, if you already know and trust each other that's um, you, as you've said about your work with scientists you know in developing that trust it's um, so much easier to work with someone you've already had a positive experience of working with in the past so it's been like it feels sort of strange we haven't had a preview you know we didn't have an exhibition opening um uh we opened your show what five months after um we intended <laughs> <laughs> um so it's a, been a, a slow and drawn out process but we're really looking forward um when we're not looking forward to it finishing by any stretch it's a joy to have the work in the gallery and to um, get to ex experience it um, so deeply. Um, but we are having an event on its um, Thursday, the 22nd of July, um, a sort of a meet you in real life opportunity. Um, so, and also an opportunity to celebrate the exhibition. Um, before it closes to the public on Sunday the 25th of July. So if you haven't had a chance to come and see the show in real life, please do. It's really beautiful. Um, but if, if you can, come to, come to that event on the 22nd. And, you know, I, and I just want to say to you, Vicky and Paul, you know, as I said, what a delight it's been to have you back in Aspects is life. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, to, to enable us to show this really beautiful work to, to launch this really important anniversary for us. So thank you. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and kind of likewise, it's been really kind of great to return to Aspects and, mm. and you know, and to, and also because it's, um, you know, that's very much a journey that we 
kind of went on from that first show and it and it kind of really really kind of does um give you an opportunity to reflect i think when you've you know, yeah to, to it come, does you know, yeah come back and and this as well it's been a great conversation yeah, yeah, yeah. thank you <laughs> I've really enjoyed it too. Hopefully um, the participants have too. So um, just want to say a big thank you and um, yeah, see you on the 22nd for our little celebration. Bye thank everyone. You. Thanks for coming. Great. Thank you. Bye. Bye.